Scott, we're going to take a very short break. I just want to remind everyone who's watching that we are talking with Scott Patterson, who is a Wall Street Journal reporter. He is also the author of a New York Times bestseller. The name of the book is The Quants. Uh, go to the website, scottpattersonreports.com. You're going to learn an awful lot more, and you're definitely going to want to. Uh, Scott, I want to go to your book. Uh, you said that this is on page 104, that in the 1980s, they, I think you're talking about the quants, were at best second-class citizens on the investment bank's trading floors. Did, mm -hmm. that, did that create some kind of uh, anger or revenge motive in them? Right. It, yeah, I, I, it did, because they all felt like they were smarter than these traders. And we were talking about Aaron Brown, and, and he was one of those quants who, you know, he, he knew that they looked down on, on him as a second-class citizen. And uh, what he did was uh, he, he, there was this very popular game among these traders uh, called Liar's Poker, which is essentially everybody gets a $20 bill, and they bet on how many numbers are on the serial numbers on the bills. And he, uh, he devised a way to, to beat Liar's Poker using quantitative strategies, um, a lot of times quants were roped into these games and, and put into disadvantageous situations um, by this method that Aaron came up with. They actually beat Liars Poker and ended up uh, killing Liars Poker because they, they kind of took the fun out of it. You know, um, with, with so all, it, it was kind of a symbol of how the quants were taking over. With all due respect to them, it seems like they kind of didn't have enough to do. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I, you know, I, I, he told me about this whole story like he would go home at night and and pro program it on his computer and they actually were trading playing with each other over a, a primitive version of the internet oh. so you know well, these guys are real nerds i mean there's no question about it well speaking of the of the internet what was the quants role in creating the dot-com bubble of the 90s mm. um I, you know i think that the the dot-com bubble was uh more a symptom of irrational exuberance among investors and the, and the quants, to their credit, uh, many of them were saying that this this thing is uh, out of control. Like Cliff Asnes, who we talked about, was uh, saying, you know, in the er in early 2000s that this whole thing was a, a bubble, and it's an example of what can go wrong with the quant strategies because Cliff almost went out of business just as he opened up his hedge fund. Did they have a role in the in the bubble bursting? Um, I, I think that the, the you can't lay the dot com bubble at the feet of the quants. Um, the, there were things that had happened before that, like long term capital management uh -huh. was this giant hedge fund that uh, quant hedge fund that blew up in 1998, and after that happened, the Fed uh, flooded the the system with liquidity in 98 and 99 and and you could say that that helped uh feed into the bubble mm -hmm. um but the bubble i would say, say the dot-com bubble was more just everyday investors um there there are some complicated reasons why some people might say that it was a it, there were some quiet theories behind it like one is the value of a company is uh fully justified by its stock price so if you if you said that the stock price was rational, uh, you, you know Cisco being at five hundred dollars a share was rational. Yeah. Um, so and 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 that's how you know worked. But uh, I, I think there are other things that Quant did, Quants have done that that you know you can definitely blame them for. But the dot com bubble, uh, I wouldn't say that's one of them. Uh, you also describe in your book some really lavish lifestyles and some unusual behavior of the Quants. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these guys are, you know, they came from the middle class. They weren't really used to riches, and they suddenly were found themselves with hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. So, you know, Ken Griffin began uh, buying art. He, he bought some really expensive uh, Renoirs and and other uh, he he was I think he was spending more than anybody else for a period of time. Yeah, you, you uh, talked about a sixty million, eighty million dollar art purchases. Right. Wow. Um, Peter Muller uh, started flying around in a private jet. Uh, so did Cliff Asnes. I think got his own jet. Yeah. Um, didn't Muller try to buy an island or something in Hawaii, or just try to buy Hawaii? I think he loved it, didn't he? He. He would have, I think he would have if he could. Yeah, he loved, he loved Hawaii. One of the greatest stories about Mueller, though, is that 
even when he was uh, he was making all this money, um, at one point he, he sort of fancied himself as a musician, and he, he played in cabarets and stuff. And, and at one point in the in the 90s, he uh, to get himself used to playing in front of people, he started carrying his electric uh, piano down to the subways of New York City, and he'd open up the case and start collecting change and singing. Uh, ballads and, and Simon and Garfunkel songs and, uh, and and you know the people walking past him tossing nickels and pennies into his case had no idea that this guy is a star trader Morgan Stanley worth hundreds of millions of dollars. <laughs> well let's actually let's get into some of the hardcore business now. Page 93 of your book. Credit default swaps were created in the early 1990s by Bankers Trust but it wasn't until the math wizards at J.P. Morgan got their mitts on them that credit deriv derivatives took off. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about J.P. Morgan because it seems to be the darling or the survivor or somehow has been able to thrive uh, when much of the rest of Wall Street did not. Right. And, you know, I think part of that could go back to the fact that they were the creators of some of these very toxic uh, securities. Um, you know, at the time, they weren't toxic. They were just, it was just an idea that they had to create... Uh, these complex securities that were made up of credit default swaps and basically a credit default swap it, it sounds complicated but it's really just insurance on a bond and what these uh, JP Morgan wizards came up with were ways to bundle up credit default swaps in order to uh, create an insurance product on a lot of bonds and they uh, they marketed this thing across Wall Street a lot of other banks started using it, and th the other banks uh, didn't really understand the risks involved in these products. The core group at Morgan or at J.P. Morgan that had originally created this thing, which, by the way, it's called a synthetic collateralized debt obligation. That's oh. the last time I'll say that because it's, <laughs> uh, you know, just saying it makes you makes you want to cry. Yeah, but, pretty uh, much. <laughs> J.P. Morgan, um, the the guys who created this thing, as the uh, mortgage, as the housing bubble took off, people were buying insurance on mortgage products, essentially. And a lot of banks were putting those things on their balance sheets and stuff that they thought was completely safe. The J.P. Morgan uh, group looked at what these other banks were doing and thought they were insane, and, and they weren't doing it. Uh, not as much. They did get into some of it and did get caught with uh, some of that, uh, you know, those bad securities on their books, but not remotely as much as banks like, you know, Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers or AIG. Well, when you, when you talk about the synthetic whatever, the credit default swaps uh, yeah. tied up with the sub subprime mortgages where nobody can tell what anything is worth, uh -huh. is, is Warren Buffett right about that, or was he right about that when he said, beware of geeks bearing formulas? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I had to quote that from my book because... You know, he, he is just dis, uh, extremely distrustful of things that seem complex um, and, and not just a, immediately uh, understandable. He, he's actually taking some shots because Berkshire Hathaway, the company that he runs, has dabbled in derivatives. And uh, when you look at the derivatives that they have, they're actually pretty simple. Mm -hmm. These synthetic CDOs are wickedly complex. One of one product could have hundreds of pages of formulas um, trying, you know, that, that explain all the, the crap that's in them. So, you know, he, he's definitely, uh, he knows what he's talking about, and uh, it's the complexity it, it, that really gets people in trouble. And when things go wrong, all that complexity gets even worse because then nobody knows what's, you know, what's worth what. We're going to take another break. Uh, Scott Patterson, who is uh, with the Wall Street Journal, has written the New York Times bestseller, The Quants, How a New Breed of Math Whizzes Conquered Wall Street and Nearly Destroyed It. Uh, go to the website, scottpattersonreports.com, and you will be just wildly interested in, in getting this book and reading it because you're going to learn so much, but it will also make you mad. I've got it.